Martinez, and I'm going to present remote access to seafloor data uh, and a use case about uh, OPC UPC, which is a site integrated in the MSO network. So, first, what is OPC and what is MSO? Uh, MSO stands for European Multidisciplinary Seafloor and Water Column Observatory. So it's a network of different facilities scattered around the European seas, with mainly focused on environmental monitoring. So it's a distributed research infrastructure, which has 12 uh, deep sea nodes and also three test sites, which are uh, located in shallow waters. The objective of this network is to uh, provide data for biology, oceanography, and geological studies. So. OPC is one of the regional sites of this network, which is an underwater cabled observatory. Uh, it's a shallow water, so it's not, it's not in deep waters. Uh, it has a dual role. It, can, it, is a, it does a role of uh, coastal monitoring, so we can monitor the ecosystem near to the coast, but it's also a test site where we can deploy and test new instruments to validate them. And it's managed by uh, UPC, which is the Technical University of Catalonia. Here we can see the map uh, where the, with the location of OPSI. It's in the north uh, east of Spain, in Villanova de Geltrú, which is south of Barcelona, in a, a depth of 20 meters, four kilometers offshore. And it has two nodes. We have a surface buoy but an, a seafloor node. Here we can see. Um, since it is a cable observatory here in this picture, in the, the green line represents the cable, which is going to the ground station. So since we are a cable observatory, we have uh, fiber optics communications and a power supply, which allows us to have real time data streaming, which is not common in this type of, of in this type of observatories. And since it's quite shallow, it is operated by scuba divers, which is much cheaper and easier than uh, doing it with um, robots. So we can achieve a really easy sensor deployment, and this is why we are a test site. So here is uh, a diagram of the, of the observatory. We have here the seafloor node where we deploy the majority of sensors. Some of the sensors are moored independently but connected to the seafloor node. And we also have a surface buoy where we deploy some meteorological sensors. We have a, a huge variety of different sensors. I'm not going to go into the details of them all, but uh, you have to keep in mind that we are measuring variables relevant for oceanography studies, meteorology, underwater noise, uh, biodiversity. For instance, and here we have some different types of data that we are using. We are even doing video, uh, video analysis for biodiversity. And apart of all these different types of data, we are also uh, involved in many different transnational access activities. So different users from companies and institutions come here to deploy their sensors. We're going to see this later. So regarding our environmental monitoring capacities, uh, this wide variety of sensors that we have at OPSI allows us to monitor six of the more relevant indicators uh, to assess the environment, environmental status according to the uh, MSFD framework, which is a framework from the European Commission to determine if an environment is um, in a good health or not. A part of this uh, core sensor that we are uh, using to, to monitor the environment, we uh, also have a lot of different uh, transnational access activities where so, uh, small, medium enterprise companies and different research institutions come to deploy their new sensors and their new um, prototypes. Um, and in the past years, we have done more than 20 different TNAs with both physical access and with virtual access to our facilities. So when we talk about access, we mean they come here, they bring a new sensor and we integrate the sensor into our infrastructure. So here we have some of the funding agencies uh, that allows us to do these TNA activities. So. Once we deploy this, how do, what's the data architecture, how users can access our data? So first, we, um, we, def we deployed this new uh, data architecture. We are following the FAIR principles, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. 
we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So we use open source existing tools and we try to, to open data as much as possible. And since we have seen, we have different types of data. So we need to support this heterogeneity of data. Okay, this is our infrastructure. This is more or less how it looks like. And I'm going to do, explain briefly the different services that we have deployed. So the first thing that we have is this, when the sensor data arrives at our system, is this um, quality control. So this, uh, we can detect spikes and erroneous data and discard it, well, not discard it, but flag it uh, to mark it as suspicious or bad data. So we are using the cartoon manual for oceanographic quality control data. So we can, and we do a, a lot of automated tests such as spikes, out of range, climatology tests. And we are using an, an open source implementation provided by IOS. So here is this, this process. And well, for instance, we can detect when some data is out of range, we can detect if we have some spikes, we can also detect uh, if for a sensor is failing and we, it's providing flat data. Once we have this flagged and, and we are sure that um, it's clear and that this is let's say good, we ingest it into this system, which is a sensor things API, which is a standard from the Open Geospatial Consortium, which focuses on flexibility and interoperability and allows us to manage this data um, even if it has different origins. It uses a very simple but powerful REST API and it supports pseudo-engineers data. We are using the Frost server, which is the implementation from the Frankhofer Institute. So this is uh, the core where we store all our data. This, well, this is the, the schema. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but what's important is that we keep a registry of every sensor, every station, every variable that we measure we linked all this together. Uh, so, so we achieve a very high data traceability and it's very flexible. So we can uh, embed also specific metadata for specific parameters. However, this does not scale very good. And we found some solutions that with using this time scale plugin for Postgres, which helps us to, to scale in a much better way than the default uh, implementation. So once we have our data ingested into our database and our API, then we export it and we have different uh, services where users can access this data. For instance, AirDAP, which is a, is a standardized service that provides access to subsets of scientific data. And it's a de facto standard in oceanographic data because a lot of different aggregators are using it, such as MSOERIC, MMNET, Copernicus, and so on. And it has, uh, machine to machine interfaces, but also is accessible by humans and it's maintained by, by NOAA. So here we can see, this is a list of the data sets that we have at our AirDAP server. Then you can select some of the data set, you can select some parameters, you can take only some of the variables, you can sub uh, select the time and you can even do some graphs and export them in different formats. The interface is not very nice, but it's really powerful. So the next service that we have deployed is the CCAN, which is an open source data management system. It's very, very popular. And it's mainly a catalog of different resources. So AirDAP provides a very active way of um, slicing the data, but CCAN provides uh, access to data sets, data sheets, metadata, and mainly any, any kind of file can be accessed through CCAN. It also has both machine-to-machine uh, -machine and human interfaces. And here we can see, for instance, some of the data sets. We provide the different data sets for different sensors. And inside the data set, there is different metadata files and different uh, subsets of data. And finally, we also have deployed a Grafana service, which is an open source um, dashboard service. Uh, it's a very intuitive and powerful visualization, visualization tool and is broadly used in different types of uh, visualization services. So for instance, here we have a dashboard with some of this uh, oceanographic data for uh, CTD sensors on salinity, temperature, conductivity, and so on. So what happens when someone comes to our facility and wants to deploy a new sensor? We have here two different options. Uh, if they want to use our infrastructure, it's possible. 
the only limitation that we put is that all the data that we are storing needs to be open source. So we manage the data with the, the sensor, we gather this data and we ingest this data into our system. And then it's automatically available you know, all these, in all these services that um, I explained before. But if for any reason, someone is not interested in publishing this data, what we also do is to provide uh, remote access to our network using a VPN or a specific service deployed for this transnational activity. So here in the red line represents the data which we are not storing and is directly managed by the users. And the green line represents the data that we store and we parse and we publish. So these are the two different ways to manage the data. So to end some conclusions. So uh, we provide many different types of machine to machine APIs and interfaces. We try to be as standardized as possible to use open source tools which are um, really accepted and used by the community. And we try to connect our infrastructure as much as possible with other aggregators such as MSOERI, Copernicus, Ebonnet. All, all of them are relevant within the uh, marine observing community. Uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, Thank you very much for the presentation. That was very interesting. I think certainly on the um, data and metadata management side, um, uh, very, very impressive and how well this is organized in the community. Uh, are there questions from anyone? You can please raise your hand or just put a question in the chat. And to give people a chance to think, uh, can I maybe ask a first question? Um, you show all this impressive data that you can collect and that people have access to from your services. Um, how is the integration of artificial intelligence into an analysis on of this data? Uh, do you offer services around that, or is there in the community um, work on this on this front? Okay, we are not yet implementing any um, artificial intelligence here. We are mainly uh, devoted to. Um, acquiring the data. So once we acquire the data and we publish it in a proper format, then anyone, since everything is published and it's accessible for machines, so anyone can develop such an artificial intelligence tool and connect to this data and train models and so on. We will, hopefully we will be doing some experiments in a, in a new European project with some automated video analysis and we will deploy this also in our infrastructure, but it's future work. At the moment, we only provide the data in the appropriate format, so others can train their models and, and use it as, as they please. Thank you. Uh, are there any further questions? Yes, Andre, please go ahead. Yeah, short question, and maybe I missed it. In terms of infrastructure, it's very interesting. I just wondering, is there any like problems because all this stuff is underwater? I mean, in terms of cabling, communications, and is there any interruptions or how is everything uh, on a twenty meters level? So you don't need to <laughs> to to ask for the deep deep water divers to fix stuff or. Just curious, very interesting. No, there are, there are millions of problems because um, um, the sea is, is a very um, aggressive environment. So all everything will eventually break, everything. So we need to do a lot of maintenance operations. Um, and this is, well, it requires a lot of effort in terms of maintenance. So we, we are diving um, more or less every week or every two weeks to do maintenance operations and even and if there are storms or uh, something of these extreme events, we are always losing some of or some cables, so we need to replace them. So for, from time to time, we lose communications, we locate where the failure is and fix it. So it's it's quite challenging, because the, but it's the nature of the of the marine domain. So it's salty, affairs, it, everything will we corrode it and eventually will break. So we need to be really careful and and fix, continuously fix all the sensor and all the cables 
the cables are the most the, the most fragile part of every marine system. So we are changing them every year or so. Okay, I see. Uh, do you have any any uh, uh, like uh, constant monitoring system, especially for that? Like saying, okay, I, I don't have a communication with this uh, piece of equipment in the last thirty minutes. Please check or ping manually or something like that. Or yes, we use a Zabbix system where we have set alarms for everything for um, for communication, but also for the health of the systems that, that are deployed in the sea. And we get real-time alarms for almost everything. So we can then it's very easy to locate where is the, the failure. So is the sensor responding? Is the junction box responding? So where is the and then we can get an alarm of okay, the junction box is not responding responding to to a thing, or this sensor um can, power consumption is too high and maybe it's burned. So everything is in a Zyrex system and we get uh, alarms in real time. So we can easily and quickly fix it. Nice, thanks. Yeah, thanks for, for sort of explaining the realities of working in this domain. I think this is quite interesting for those of us who see the sea as this nice thing for holidays and not the realities of putting machinery underwater. Um, there was the question for a raised hand from Andy. Um, Andy, do you want to ask anything? Uh yeah, I, I just was wondering if there's still time. That's why I lowered my hand. But no, very, uh, very interesting talk. I hope we can get the slides. Uh, we, we also use timescale and we use it for large uh, data coming from uh, the accelerators. So it could be interesting to exchange on that. But my question was uh, open data. When you say open data, do you mean uh, open data with a digital object identifier or, or is it just open in a more better sort of uh, unofficial way or, or, or do you actually try and apply um, the fair principles when you speak about open data? Okay, we are still uh, in the process of uh, doing it completely fair because it's uh, like a never ending <laughs> work, <laughs> but uh, we try to be as, as much as possible fair. And we don't have DOI for all the data yet, but it's work on progress. What we do have is when we publish a paper analyzing this data, the subset of data that we used for this paper in particular, we publish it to a repository such as Pangea or there are others. And then we get a DOI for this specific data. But now we are in the process of automatically publishing it in real time and getting the DOI for every sensor, every deployment. And so everything will be uh, open and with a DOI in a proper way. Okay, oh, thanks a lot.